Good afternoon. My name is Mike Carney, and I'm here in beautiful Baltimore, Maryland on the 30th of June, 1992, and it's my great pleasure this afternoon to have the opportunity to interview a Mr. Hayward G.S. Murray, one of the grand men of ASHRAE. And hey, I thank you for stopping by this afternoon and joining us for this interview, and uh, welcome to ASHRAE, and welcome to uh, Baltimore, Maryland. You're from Victoria, British Columbia, aren't you? Yes. That's the third or fourth chapter I have belonged to is Victoria. Is that right? Now you started out in Winnipeg, you told me. That's right. right. And uh, I only had access to a ash ray guide for ash v guide at the that time for one month. Uh -huh. And uh, then I left for Montreal and then I heard from the Honeywell fellow who said we're going to form a chapter of ASH and VE in Montreal, and would you like to become a charter member? And in what year was this? 1935, about September, October. Okay, and having had access to and recognized what it was in respect to what I was earning my small salary from, I realized that this would be the educational bridge beyond a BA degree into a, a business. Let me go back a little bit. You had mentioned that your degree was not in engineering, but in the arts. You had, That's right, uh, BA. BA. Not Bad BSC, B, okay. or BSC, of C. Okay. So uh, clarification, I graduated with a bachelor of arts degree specialization, math, and economics. And uh, then uh, it became necessary to earn a living. So I started with the humidifying equipment in Winnipeg for residential and commercial application, moved to Montreal in 30, late 34. And uh, as I say, this came up fairly quickly, and bang, within a year, they were forming this chapter. And yes, I wanted to use the educational capability for that, which I felt already. Not, I didn't know a hell of a lot, but I knew, sorry, I knew enough to realize that I needed something else than what I had. Okay, and then you look for, at, for the society, which at that time was ASH and VE, as your source of information in this field? Certainly. In the field, okay. Yes. And uh, got involved in the starting of Montreal chapter. And Hey, you were talking about the job of heating aircraft hangars, and that was during the war? Uh, yes. Uh, as I said, uh, we had an affiliation with Lee Engineering of Youngstown, Ohio, who had this highly industrial uh, warm air heating system of very large capacity. Uh, up until that time, I'd handled units with one or two thousand CFM direct fired heating equipment for homes and small commercial. But this was the other end of the scale. The biggest one I put in was eight, we put in was 85,000 CFM, which is quite a chunky. Well, it took a 40 horsepower motor to run it. And uh, the concept they used was, first off, is you're interested in the first five feet off the floor when you heat a hanger. The rest of the stuff, the problem is to keep the temperature down above and keep the heat down here and not have it overheat up there. And the standard method of control of the other types of heating steam unit heaters, projection type, was that they drove it down to the floor for part of the time, then they stopped the, the fans. And of course, the stratification started right away, and then the hanger, they're drafty. Besides, they have opening doors. So anyway, this system was pretty good and would control the temperature floor to ceiling by confining the air circulation the first five feet off the floor. In other words, you weren't interested above that because it would 
assume a natural situation, if there was uh, an air change, it would be practically flat floor to ceiling. Once you stop the things, then it piles up the ceiling, cold at the floor. And the whole premise was deliver your hot air at the floor, pull your cool air sheet off the floor. And with that equipment, it was about a year before we really started to move. That had uh, Dunkirk. Before that, the war was, uh, you know, a Cold War, crazy war. It was a game almost where they just sat and did nothing except bomb England a bit. But once Dunkirk happened, the floodgates opened because they had to train the pilots other than Great Britain. They were full of fighter pilots, but they couldn't be running training exercises and moved all the thing over to Canada. And they sent over people from all over the world in the British Empire to train there. Anyway, uh, after two or three years of handling these, what we call direct fired, by means of coal and stoker and some gas fired equipment, then they uh, said, well, we're having shortages of manpower. We've got to get uh, a central station plant. And I said, well, we can do the same thing with steam blast coils and uh, use the same air system and it does as effective a job and it removes the probable, uh, problem of having a heater in every hangar. We could put one steam plant, feed the steam to five or six hangars. And that was the succession after about three years and a uh, hundred so hangers that brought that system. So at the end of the war, we had oh, about 235 hangers, each one of them 200 and some by 164 heated with these systems. Well, that was really an interim phase that was caused by the war shutting down refrigeration and air conditioning jobs. They had needed for other purposes. So when the war finished, then just had to convert to back to air conditioning. And uh, at that time, I, after 12 years with this other group, during which we had formed the Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Division of Canadian Comstock Company, done some smaller work and then some large, little larger work. And as I say, um, we then re-entered the refrigeration and air conditioning work because the hangars were finished and we had to go back to our normal business. Was that cooling you were talking about and was that by mechanical means at this time? Oh, well, we put in a first refrigeration uh, uh, systems in theaters back at 37, 36. Comfort cooling then? Is this comfort cooling then? Yes, comfort yeah. cooling for yeah. theaters, and that was the first uh, first area where cooling was put in was really in theaters. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, the theaters, uh, a few of them, they were got very competitive right after the war. Everybody was in it, and uh, we had some liaisons with people for whom we had done these two big aircraft plants with firm in Montreal and they used to call us in for advice on some of their industrial applications. We'd work with them and negotiate or bid a job and do the work. And uh, in other words, my area of specialization worked fine with them when they had to oversee my plans and specifications and, and oh, my our plans and specification, and uh, we send it out as part of a parcel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This air conditioning started to get uh, industrially oriented because the comfort stuff was very competitive. Uh, the industrial stuff where you had to apply more brains was, could be handled on what we call a negotiated contract. Mm -hmm. 
between the engineer and the owner and ourselves, not usually through a general. Okay, not, not normally not through normal. a general. This is in, in industrial. Well, that's the only way they could control it, because uh -huh. the general is yeah. shop, shopping. Okay. Uh, I had become involved in ASHRAE only to the extent that I was served on the Board of Governors because I had a sort of job that I was going to, doing a lot of traveling. And Is this at the local level? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I really couldn't, and nor did I want to, get involved in secretarial work, you know, or stuff. But Board of Governors was a great insight to what makes chapters tick. The shows were great insight into our product mechanical equipment that we used and also the techniques that are developed by people from ASHRAE and ASRE. When you say it shows, uh, do you mean the shows associated with the society meetings or the, sh the pr uh, programs at the local chapter level? The local chapter thing, and then there's the annual shows and the regional deals. The annual shows and annual and semi-annual meetings were the mecca for intelligentsia in that area. And this is what you used as your educational bridge throughout your career, is it not? You you yes, picked you yeah. picked brains every place you went. And, yes, I did. And. Uh, was well, I was interested in learning because I knew that, uh, and uh, through Ashby, ASRE, and their succeeding societies, provided all the information and also access to some very important people down here. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is be a little controversial and do the things I did for Honeywell and closing up their hospitality suite when the people were hanging around too late. <laughs> uh, they said, you know, you're controversial. I served non-committee for three or four or five times with some of these fellows, you know, like Nor uh, McMillan and others. And, uh, it gave me an insight into society and what happens to people when they are elected to office and they get in a channel and they have to elect to go or stay. Well, being a small operator, after two or three of these things, I realized, no way, stay out. You haven't got that kind of support operation that's necessary to go anywhere on national level. That's an interesting point. Hugh McMillan really uh, talked about that also. Critical, yeah, yeah, critical. Yeah, yeah. And this was about 50 of the CD. After the war, there's fractionating of sources of information. There's shows all over the lot. Every guy and his dog, every person and his dog wanted to get into the shows. And there's, they're all wanting a piece of the action, the new big industry, which was forecast by Madison Avenue, was going to pull us out of the Depression in 1932 or three, which was a slight overstatement of fact. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so I, I started to get exposed to the, at least the elective side of society. And uh, that was intriguing because the premise was the job seeks the man. But they had a two-level nominating committee there's one man from each region, and then there's several put on by society who are attacked in society's interest, not to be the political pushers of people. Mm -hmm. And I served that side. And I bumped into a president in a cab ride in from the uh, airport in Houston. He turned out to be uh, one of the older presidents, and he told us, me the story of his life during his 
time to the presidency. The presidency in those times cost him $80,000 in fees the last year when he went through the chair. You mean in lost business? Yes, $80,000 in fees in that time, it's 800000 a day. And it pretty near wrecked him. Emphasize, don't get involved. Serve where you can, but don't get involved. That's for the very few who have the support organization to back you up and have what the ASHRAE wants. And when you start to think of it from that standpoint, uh, you only got a percentage of one to two percent of the total membership, to my mind, that the ASHRAE would want to put in and provide, that have the support to do it. Sure. Hey, where you were making a point about the number of people that were entering the air conditioning business after the war, and it uh, provided you with a, an awful lot of sources for information. Was I just didn't have enough body, enough time to look at it, find out where all the meat might be, and still do my work that paid my, the, uh, paid me a, uh, money, and that uh, you have to choose between being an in intellectual popper and and cutting it back and finding one source, and this started me on a thing. Try, can't we do something to get RE? and the AE together. And, uh, and that was in the early 50s. In about 53, there was a summer meeting at Swampscott, and it was one of the first steps towards the ultimate joining of the two societies. That's A-S-R-E and A-S-H-N-V-E, which later became A S. -E. H and A E. Oh, this is a, some idea of the competitive nature. We were scared to death. R E would get air conditioning into the name before we did. Oh. And in '55, the board took action and put air conditioning in our name, so we became Ash A. Okay. And then it joined with A, a S R E, the refrigeration group. Yes. In '59. That's or right. Uh, the vote was taken in 59. Okay. I'm talking about the, the, the other people in the industry knew the same thing was going on, and they, try, they talked almost for eight or nine years. But I remember the critical meeting, as far as I was concerned, was a bull session that, that ran until 3 o'clock in the morning, had the heads of both RE and AE in and talking around. And so I asked, the offcoming president of ASRE, who I'd known since 40, I said, how long do you think it will take us to put the two societies together? And this guy was a smart person, and he says, I don't think we can do it in less than 10 years. Okay. The first formal committees were formed in 54, so sometime around 63. So I, I and a lot of other people worked hard, and it went forward on a vote on 58, which wasn't bad, five years instead of 10. Because at that time, in 53, I said, I'm not so sure our industry can afford this duplication of effort on the part of their people that they're sending to the wars. Yeah. To the meetings. I beg your pardon? To the meetings or yeah. to the war? Yes. Yeah. Well, I meant to the, yeah. tell all these different people who might become a supplant. If somebody got air conditioning, it would uh, outside, it would be a problem. And that's why the action taken in '55 to add a air conditioning to the instead of the ventilation was a highly desirable step. You attended quite a few of these meetings and uh, sessions and shows. Hayward, do you recall how many you attended? Ashray, uh, in, the dim, in the distant past, was uh, hardworking, 
They are also not total work. There's a lot of people with sense of humor and ashray, and there are some very fine efforts put on during these shows. And the shows are funny things. In the old context, there'd be a, a cocktail bar in every manufacturer's room. Order books out, get the socket, sign the paper, go away. Well, that, that sort of thing is uh, not where we fit. But Honeywell started a facility that was a real assist to society. They, start, they had a high level uh, group in charge of a suite at all its functions. And through that suite, practically all the important people of AE, RE, and Ashby went. And in, in, they would oftentimes have political things go on. It was a, They'd go into bedrooms and they'd do their little duty of uh, uh, meetings of, you know, the, the offices and the, at the top, the, the echelon, not the a whole committee, just two or three people. And that was a necessary function to have. And they fulfilled that function. And uh, John Haynes and his wife ran it. And they're both very close friends. In fact, Mrs. Haynes' son called, uh, called me the day his mother passed on, the last, just after Anaheim. And uh, there was other people. Lou Flagg. Lou Flagg in 1957 was our guest at Murray Bay at the children's table. My wife and I were entertaining our children and the other ch children at Murray Bay and we sat with them during the banquet. And Lou Flagg's first introduction was to sit with us at our table. First deal at uh, national level, okay? Well, that's the kind of thing that goes on and on and on. And of course, after all, you, things happen. It's part of a, an operation. Okay, uh, hey, name some names of people that you have particularly enjoyed and uh, things that you remember about them? Uh, there's a chap named Burke Farns in Portland, Oregon. He and I were on the nominating committee together. There's also a, number, a fellow named Carlisle Ashley, one of the real brains but of the industry who was made chair of the nominating committee. He was out of New York? Carlisle Ashley, you've interviewed him, or you interviewed him two or three years, not you no. interviewed him in Ottawa. Okay, that was, a, that was a different person, but that, what? I didn't do that interview. No, but uh, I know he was done in Ottawa because yeah. I was there. <laughs> I wasn't at the <coughs> interview. Anyway, Carlisle was such a nice person and a gentleman of the first law of the old school that he would not say the right word, damn, or no, or say. So Bert Vines realized that with the situation we'd have to be mavericks and be the outriders and keep the damn meeting on the rails and stop the politicals from the chapters from pushing through the deals. So with, it was one of the best nominating committees he ever had. Carlisle handled himself. He didn't say a, a nasty word. And he conducted the meeting and between us, <laughs> between us, we came off with a good slate. Right? Yeah. And uh, this is the sort of thing. And uh, all these chaps that you see on the upper echelons normally had uh, one or two or three or four years on nominating committee. And that's where you learn what the score is. Mm -hmm. In fact, both Bert and our, uh, I were taken off the committee because we'd been there for too many times. That was all right. Mm -hmm. But the elective process was pretty good. Mm -hmm. They were producing generally very good people. And it's continued down to this day. 
the regionals, send in the boys with the uh, people the regions are pushing, and then the three or five people who are serving society's interest on this meeting is the leavening agent that keeps things on the track mm -hmm. and forms the actual mechanics of the job. Sorry, society selects the man, mm -hmm. not the man, the job. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, the nominating process at that is, level and uh, yeah. throughout society is a to very me that's one thing. of the very important things that tells you whether you have what kind of stuff you're going to get through the yeah. chair. I think the nominating process that we have in the society is a very healthy process. Well, Norm McMillan and the other fellows you've met and have been products of that selection system. Yeah. They were strong on that. It was good. In your experience and from your perspective in comfort conditioning, what changes have you noticed? I'll tell you one thing. that This is the first hot room I've hit since I've been here. Well, the other rooms have been so full of drafts that you can't, can't live in them if you have any sensitivity to low temperature air dropping down your neck. Yeah. And it's been the same of practically every hotel. Well, this room has the benefit of a hot air Irishman. Oh, oh I'm not talking about this room. I'm talking about the meeting rooms. Oh, I see. Have you sat in many of the oh, meetings? Yeah. They're and, freezing. Yeah. yeah. We know more about Air distribution, and Nemestat was one of the smart people in uh, the business, and they knew more about air distribution than these guys exhibit today. Yes. And <laughs> you see these slot line diffusers, you know, slot. Oh, I got an air conditioned neck <laughs> trying to run a uh, volometer assessment of how much air was being exhausted from this theater and it was n not air conditioned and the air was up around 95. And I was working there for 30 minutes and the air dry and passing over my neck. I got the worst flu I ever had in my life. So I've had an air conditioned neck ever since. Are there any other suppliers that you felt were significant in your career? A Nemesat, yes. A significant supplier? Other suppliers? Oh, oh, they were, I would say, they knew more and, and changed the way f uh, the industry as much as any, uh, not the only people, but they came over from Germany and, and there's the other people, Punkalooer weren't in the same league, they did, you know, ship's cabins, some of these, the things you see on an aircraft and turn twist. But in air distribution, they had some very large diffusers that could handle up to 9,000 CFM through one outlet. Uh, the only problem with that, with the increased flow through one outlet, the noise level also increases. Volume is a consideration in the noise that comes off it. You know, there's 9,800 at the same velocity as 1,000. <laughs> anyway. Those are the things that happen. It's an interesting point you make, Hay. The, the amount of information and technology in this basic thing that is air distribution, it's not so readily available today. If you try to find a person in a town who really knows air distribution, that's very difficult. Well, there's lots that know. But the, industry or our, our construction progress uh, process tightens the money down and what happens the expensive product that has the technology goes out yeah it becomes a, a, a distributor yeah. a wholesaler yeah. item it. well I mean it, they substitution mm -hmm. and uh, they have done uh, quite a job uh, taking a lot of the uh, things that the Nanostat had and uh, the ceiling diffusing diffusers are generally not too bad. But one of the basics was you have a parameter of air stream from a circular diffuser that goes over like that, injecting a like this and goes over and carries and should go down the wall and reach a low enough velocity so it doesn't bother you and sucks air up in the middle of the room. These linear diffusers, good God, they're just a sheet of air. 
And if they're headed downwards, <laughs> you get it. Yeah. And there, it's uh, it's uh, continual pain in my life. <laughs> Walking out of meetings or doing this, yeah. I do this purposely because it gets some people to yeah. realize that I do not like the you cold. Disapprove of right. that. Okay. Um, well, Hayward, we're here in Baltimore. What uh, stops and travels are you looking forward to while we're here? Ah. Uh, well, we got lock in. So many of the meals are functions of, you know, uh, and I've eaten so many places outside that uh, oftentimes uh, that eating is uh, an interruption between drinking and talking. <laughs> well, we'll try not to have too many of those interruptions, and we'll get right back to the to the ladder here pretty soon. You and I, I look forward to that. You wish to. Name some folks that you've enjoyed seeing while you're here again, and uh, elaborate on that a little bit. Well, you have oh, it. maybe I would say there's several thousand people I've met and I've got close enough to to know. And at my age, and recall, which is pretty good, but for names, uh, it's rough. That is why I wear that thing all the time to give the other guy a break. Uh, the name tag. Yeah, you, and you uh, it's just impossible. But I've had association with so many people. Well, yes, I'm going to get your name tag, and let's do take uh, a shot of your name tag because you've got quite a number of what we call ribbons on it, and we're going to we're going to hold it up. So hold it up there so the yeah. camera gets that. Yeah. Well, hold it up on your chest, wow. and even if it flashes for a moment. Uh, at least the folks who view this video can see that uh, okay. Okay. you've got a few uh, service ribbons there, youngster. Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> first was Distinguished Service in 1967 for my efforts in the merger. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one, that's the Distinguished Service. Next one was Life Member which they gave me life in San Francisco. That's, was for, that's for living through all this stuff. That's right. right. That's right. They gave me life, and, and they sent, they caught up with me, and the Los Angeles chapter had me in, presented me with this. And then a fellow, I think that was probably for efforts on research promotion, and uh, the founding, uh, founding director of Ashray Research Canada. Mm -hmm. And I've been involved in, well, since 62 or 3 in funds for research. And uh, it's come a long way. Sure has. Six, just after the merger finished, I sat in New York on the Finance Commission and had them read out the total take for, other than show, other than portions of Jews or other special things, about $27,000. You know the kind of figures they're talking now, a million a year, just as easy as that. A million two, million half now. Yeah, yeah. yeah those are significant numbers. Very uh, much so, and that was a long way back. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting process, this process we call ASHRAE, isn't it? The, uh, one of the things that uh, is important to me, it's been uh, part of my productive effort. It has also provided me with more friends than I have. I, when I move outside of ASHRAE, with all the friends I have, I have very few. Because total, you know, twice a year you go, you go, you go, and uh, over the years <laughs> you get to have quite a lot of people. That's good. We ought to remember on this tape uh, our friend Herb. Herb, Herb Maybank. Yeah, Herb Maybank. Well, Herb has the same initials as I did. He came along on Comstock after I left to start on my own business in 1946. And uh, Herb is a, he's an alumni of the same firm I worked for 12 years of my life. 
and uh, he has a same kind of crazy sense of humor like uh, another person, ex-director, Jake Klassen, who will crawl half a mile up a sewer to set up a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Called halfway up a sewer to make a joke? Yeah. That's good. And after all, you can be as serious as hell, but if you have some way of r relaxing, you miss a lot. Yeah. Well, I think you go up the wall. You've been the chairman of the committee for not missing too much within ASHRAE. No, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm not unhappy uh, uh, to, uh, if I had done over, was sitting down now to plan it, I probably wouldn't have planned it the way it went. It simply evolved by being there and being part of these things that transpire. Mm -hmm. And I'd hate to have done some very thoughtful planning beforehand and missed all the things that I happened to fall into by chance. <laughs> and I think one of the beautiful things is this association. We're coming out of Philadelphia on a train after a show, and I had a, had a problem with sound in the biggest theater I did from the refrigeration pipelines, a sort of organ effect and it was bothering me and I was getting the run around by the Montreal uh, people representing this fan. Finally, I'm going down to the show and coming out of the show from Washington to New York by train that's so full, we're standing in the vestibule. And uh, so there's a, another couple there and I started talking. It turns out he was, works for this firm that made these compressors. And so, chance puts you in the vestibule of a nine-car train with 700 or 800 people. And the very guy I would love to talk to, I do. And this is the kind of thing that amazes both Herb and myself. And we have so many things for well, he's sleeping next door to me, and so he moves in when he lost his room down in Anaheim. And the way it went is I need the room for the night, and I said, where are you staying, Herb? He says, Thir something 13. I said, I'm in 11. <laughs> but I was wondering whether you were noisy <laughs> in your room. So, and that's how that happens so often. It's amazing. Ashray is a good breeding ground for unusual coincidences, isn't it? Yes, it's absolutely fantastic. And uh, there has been lots of people who have gone from the scene, and there's a lot of the people which, who are fine people. Would you remember one or two of those friends of yours that are now gone? One or two? A million I can remember. Al Newton? Herman Spohr. Herman Spohr, I'm glad you mentioned him. I, Herman Spohr, I asked him going out to Vancouver in 1959, I believe it was, no, 1960, on a train. We'd been to Edmonton. He, we were on the train and going into the piano bar at Jasper Park Lodge, here's Herman Spore. So I sit down, I'd met him years ago in Montreal, and, you know, gone out with him in Montreal and town. And it's gone, and he loved to sing. He used to rent the Skyway Suite, a big suite in Chicago, every time they had a show there. And uh, he'd have a piano and they'd sing harmony. And uh, it's a, if you've seen that harmony, well done. They really did it up brown in those days because it was part of the advertising. And Herman, of course, used to love to sing, and we sang at his home outside of St. Louis. On the annual meeting, we went over for a cocktail party on Sunday night, and his brother had presented him with a nice red fire truck, the old Seagrave fire truck, complete and operational, that his brother had bought for him as a Christmas present. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, we haven't been getting as many good sing songs as we used to have. Seamus Holman was trying to play the piano last night. <laughs> okay, Seamus, I've known long enough to t tell you I don't want him singing on my side. <laughs> <laughs> Seamus, nice guy, and all the rest of it. But Pearlie Barker is the guy that used to be able to play the piano. He's around here. And I was saying, we got to get a piano. Well, I'm pleased you told a little story about Herman Spohr. I cleaned the video and say Herman that. was a dear friend. OK. Through what? What the hell would I be up with the head of Alcobal? We'd use this art. Oh, not Alcobal, Sporland Val. And I also knew John Dube. And I asked Herman, do you think John Dube is serious that he only wants to stay one year as a treasurer? We put him in to plug the leaks, the, the bad situation in the treasury in 19, coming up, this is about 1950. And Herman says, don't kid yourself, Murray. He'll go through the chair. I want to, OK, he did. Herman was a pretty uh, wonderful guy. And this has been the story of my life. Ashray not only gave me an educational bridge, but it, came, it gave me a, a whole host of people that I consider friends. Ah, and Ashray has now become a social bridge as well. well the, these social gatherings were mere evidences of a lot of friends, period. And that sort of served two functions. There you go. So you know why I feel uh, the way I do about ashray. And as we bring this to a close, Hayward, is there anything else you'd like to add to the interview? Heresy? Would you like some? Oh, yeah, that's good. Some heresy <laughs> well, would be a Hayward Murray they've forgotten what a buck is worth up at the top. In, in what regard do you mean Well. That? When I first went to a show, I went to the Commodore and stayed in the studio suite for seven fifty, myself and my wife. You know what to charge today? Hundred and twenty five, hundred and thirty five. To keep from going to the poor house, I have to get a bed companion that will share the expense with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can appreciate uh, the cost of the hotel. No, no, saying. no. It's the whole up the, uh, it's the structure and the amount of money that's going through has gone up exponentially. And it's been peaking on uh, total people, 65,000 back to. 55,000, and I never expected to happen. We haven't moved, really, except the, on the international divide. We lost here. We're making it on the, uh, they're making members in the international set, but it'll never make up for the people we're losing here. I'm a Canadian, and I love a lot of people here. And so all you can say, well, is, is this the way they've got to go? Or has somebody got to be a little rougher on, uh, well, it's just the same as the government. You get big, you get sloppy. I'm not saying sloppy in respect to the things they do in an engineering way. I'm talking about allowances for travel and stuff, and too many people traveling. Well, it's a sure, big show, take it over the Orient. And unfortunately, I came from a different area. A dollar was a dollar, not a cent. Is that too critical? No, I think you and I should go spend a couple of those dollars down at the, the bar here pretty you soon. You would have to spend a dollar. Well, we'll spend a couple of them. All right. OK? Is it's it about deal. time for that? It's a deal. Hayward, thank you for joining us this afternoon. You've been a delightful interview and uh, well, great insights for the historical community. Uh, well, uh, I've uh, written, tried to write some history on Ashray. And there's a million stories, absolutely a million. One that I love in Montreal when we were heating and ventilating engineers is these fellows used to come up and be sent up to New York to address Montreal chapter. 
And in the middle of winter, sometimes it'd be 10 or 20 below. And we used to have a delegation of fellows that walked down to the station out onto the platform to meet the guest speaker and walk back with them and do the same when he finished the meeting and out on the midnight train to Toronto or New York. And then if it was very cold, sometimes we'd get across the street to Mother Martin's where they made, made the best onion soup in Montreal and also had good hot toddies and rally round. Well, Hayward, we'd like to thank you for joining us this afternoon, and I think it's time for you and I to uh, find a place to rally round, as you say. Thank you.